welcome to the Further Light Podcast, presented by Wisconsin Freemasonry, helping you accomplish your Masonic goals through education and more light. And now, I present to you, Brother Chris Ludke and Jonathan Schrader. This is Brother Chris Lickie, and today we are going to continue our exploration of the history and issues of recognition surrounding Prince Hall Masonry, a topic that we really don't get into enough, even though they are Brother Masons. And joining me again is Worshipful Brother Jonathan Schrader. Jonathan, thank you for joining us again. Uh, thank you for having me. And I, I keep on hearing you introduce yourself as brother, but we should say worshipful brother as well. Yeah, it always sounds wrong when you say it <laughs> about yourself, but- uh, I know, I know, I know. I, I feel the same way when I hear it. So to get on uh, with Prince Hall, just as a quick recap, in the last episode, we looked at how uh, these brothers were initiated. We looked at- why they petitioned the Grand Lodge of England, how they went from a lodge to a mother lodge or a provincial Grand Lodge. And we're up to the point of around, let's call it 1812 for a nice round number that isn't entirely random. So where do we stand at that point? How did relations change in this period, if they change, between Prince Hall and the Blue Lodges leading up to the Civil War? Well, at this point in time, we have essentially a number of different separate Grand Lodges uh, operating. We have your, your Grand Lodges in each one of the states at this point, as well as you have this, this Prince Hall Grand Lodge, which is operating mainly out of Massachusetts. At this point as well, we find that there had been in, in the late 17, early 1800s, right around that turn of the century. We know from some of the records that were left behind here that the Blue Lodge members in, in for instance, Boston were well aware of the existence of African Lodge. There is uh, some stories that have been published about the, that members of St. Andrew's Lodge in Boston, which is a fairly famous lodge, you know, has some ties to the revolution um, in terms of meeting in the same tavern as, uh, as the Sons of Liberty, that the members of this lodge participated in the, uh, in the installation of officers when African Lodge received its charter from the Grand Lodge of England. And we know that there were even public announcements in local publications saying that, you know, where, where the African Lodge met. So this, they were well aware of each other's presence. Beyond that, we don't see evidence of you know, any type of infighting back and forth, with the exception of we can pretty much guess that based on Masonic tradition that uh, they would not necessarily be meeting with each other or uh, operating on that on that uh, level of uh, being able to visit each other's lodges and that that type of uh, relationship. But from a historical perspective, that's kind of proving a negative. So we also can't disprove correct that it happened or didn't correct. The evidence at this point in time is kind of sketchy. Um, I, I did attempt to dive in and find some, some imprint evidence of, of this beyond the stories that were written in a couple of the, the books that I cited as evidence for paper that we mentioned in the last episode. But uh, beyond that, I don't have like a copy of the Boston newspaper that states this is where they met. And when we're looking at the Prince Hall, the next thing in this time frame that comes up, or at least comes to mind, would be abolition. Are they involved in abolition, the abolitionist movement or the Underground Railroad or anything in terms of the emancipation of slaves? 
so it's kind of interesting. In his later years, prior to his death, Prince Hall did, on a couple of occasions, speak and write letters to the members of his lodge. So uh, there's a couple of letters that are quite well preserved. Uh, one was dated in 1792, another in 1797, where he kind of speaks to this. It almost seems as though he was giving a charge to his Lodge members at this point. In his 1792 letter, he states that it is the duty of, ma of masons of our lodge to help and assist all fellow men in distress. Let them be of what color or nation they may be, uh, even our enemies. So at this point in time, he's kind of telling his, bro his brothers that they have to be yeah, helpful and that they are to assist any person in distress, no matter their origin, background, and even if they are our enemies to them. Um, later on in, in, uh, in his 90, 1797 uh, letter, he talks about how nothing in the world is stable, that all things are changeable, and that um, he asks the brothers to have patience and strength to bear up against the troubles which, uh, which the, the brotherhood and, and, and particularly African-Americans are, are experiencing at that, during that time. There's also a little bit of another interesting piece of evidence that I found from that point in time that comes from not Prince Hall, but actually the chaplain of, of their lodge, um, a guy by the name of John Morant or, um, or Merritt. And he gave a number of speeches when they talked about how Masons are supposed to be, or how they are supposed to act. He, uh, he jumped on the idea of racial prejudice uh, by talking about he says, and I'll, I'll quote him by saying that, what can these uh, wretches think who, dis who despise their fellow men as though they were not of the same species with themselves and would if their power deprive them of blessings and comfort of life with, he says, with God in his bountiful uh, goodness hath freely given to all of his creatures to improve and enjoy. Essentially, he's if we paraphrase this a little bit, he's going after the, the institution of slavery and the institutions that uh, promote prejudice and racism in society at that point. So essentially, you have a couple of different writers and speakers within that lodge who are promoting the idea that members should be active in the, in the idea of, uh, of promoting brotherly love and friendship amongst all people, not just of one race. Did you get a, any sense in your research how those views, those very abolitionist views, compared to masonry in roughly the same geographic area at the time? Masonry at this time would have, uh, Blue Lodge masonry at this time would have been um, much like, I'll be honest with you, the way that we are today, where we may have had members with a varying number of political views. We know for a fact that there were members of the fraternity who were slave owners in the South um, that were pro-slavery in their political views. And then we act, and then there is evidence of members who were abolitionists. This whole idea that we tend to have in our lodges that we don't that uh, um, a political talk, religious talk would be a detriment to the harmony of the brotherhood, as opposed to an institution like slavery was that was particularly impactful on the brothers of Prince Hall, the brothers in the Blue Lodges were of varying opinions on this topic. And this is a good time just to remind the listener that the fraternity is made up of men, imperfect in nature, and 
we tend to reflect the larger society around us. If you happen to be in an abolitionist community, you're probably more likely to be abolitionist. If you happen to be in a slave owning territory, you might be more likely to be a slave owner. So we're not making any broad generalizations here. Absolutely not. We have uh, some of our more respected or most respected members of the fraternity from this time period were individuals who did engage in the institution of slavery. Brother George Washington was a slave owner, as an example, as was Brother Andrew Jackson. So this, is a, this was definitely something that the Brotherhood had to contend with at that time period and did so in, a very, in various ways. But in, uh, in all, we can, pro we can fairly well surmise that they weren't kicking people out for being slave owners. So just to sort of give us a, a, a point here, a point of reference, we're getting into the Civil War. How big is Prince Hall Masonry at this point, say 1860 or so? Uh, pretty small. Only a handful of lodges. They were operating uh, mainly in the northern uh, states at this point. We don't have a lot of evidence of them spreading into the south until later on um, uh, in the immediate reconstruction era. So how does the Civil War and the immediate reconstruction era affect them? Does the Emancipation Proclamation have a positive or negative impact on them? Well, as somebody who has uh, taught history for a while, I have my own views as about the, the impact of the Emancipation Proclamation. and. Um, However, the, the real emancipation coming with the 13th Amendment, the end of the, uh, of the Civil War, we find that membership in Prince Hall does start to rise quite a bit in this time period. And we do see that uh, the lodges do spread out. Um, so within a 40 year time span, 35 year time span from the mid 1860s up until 1900, you have Prince Hall uh, lodges that are spreading across what was at that point the United States. Uh, by the turn of the century to, into the 20th century, we have at least one, if not more, Prince Hall lodges operating is, as far southwest as Texas. We know this because their activity there, their presence there, bird the past Grand Master of the state of Texas to even write on the subject of the legitimacy of Prince Hall Masonry. One of the big things that, that we find is that Prince Hall Masonry was quite controversial as, as is not a big surprise, but its existence, especially in some of our, our Southern jurisdictions, uh, quite uh, infuriated the, the Blue Lodges that were there. So as, a, as an example, I, I found a, uh, a pamphlet that was written in, again in 1908 by a guy uh, who is a past most worshipful brother, uh, C.L. Mitchell, who was the past Grandmaster of the state of Texas. And in this statement, and it's not exactly the most comfortable thing to, to uh, read if you were to read it from cover to cover, um, considering the attack that he even starts his, his opening statement with, which uh, happens to be, I'll uh, quote it here. It says that in order that the members of the fraternity may have correct and thorough understanding about the origin and the irregularity of Freemasonry among colored men in the state of Texas. So in there, we know that Prince Hall Masonry has extended itself to Texas at this point. It will be necessary to state the time and place that clandestine, that clandestine and spurious Freemasonry among colored men was instituted in the state of Massachusetts. And also, the establishing of that self-constituted African Grand Lodge of modern Masons of Massachusetts, which is now Prince Hall Grand Lodge, 
for it was from that corrupt, notorious, bogus Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts whose record covers the very blackest page in Masonic history that Freemasonry among colored men in the state of Texas first originated from. To end quote there. So he uses some terminology that's pretty dang strong in my book to describe his view and obviously uh, the viewpoint of many in his jurisdiction, if not across jurisdictions, about the uh, the existence of of Prince Hall Masonry at that time period. Let's go backwards a little bit and deal with this idea of recognition. What's the sort of rough history of recognition of Prince Hall Masonry? It goes back a little ways. Yeah, it does. Essentially, the biggest issues with recognition, and when I was writing on the subject, I was looking at this as to whether or not the excuse or the uh, the reasons that were stated for not recognizing had anything to do with racial background. And it's fairly clear that the brothers at that time were not necessarily coming out all the time and clearly stating that they were denying membership or denying recognition because of race. However, we can clearly tell from statements such as the one from the aforementioned uh, Grandmaster of Texas and others that race did come into play. So a couple of the issues with recognition, one of it goes back to the conversation in the last episode about the definition of freeborn. So whether or not a, a person who is a, a former slave could be recognized as a brother given, given their birth as a in servitude. And then also one of the the biggest um, arguments against recognition happens to be the one jurisdiction rule, which essentially is where our Grand Lodges agree to, to recognize other Grand Lodges, but when we recognize them, we kind of keep to this idea that there's only one recognized Masonic jurisdiction within a geographic area. So for instance, in Wisconsin, if another Grand Lodge were to recognize the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin as being regular and legitimate Masons, they would not necessarily entertain a petition from another group claiming to be a gra- the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin or something similar. And is that one jurisdiction rule something that's being sort of created for this specific circumstance, or is it something that's broader and used on a regular basis? It's it's pretty well used on a regular basis. It just, and it is still used today. However, it is something that was, it played a a secondary role, and in some cases, a bit of a primary role in uh, preventing Prince Hall Grand Lodges from being able to gain recognition by the Blue Lodges at this time or in, throughout the course of, uh, of history here. So as an example, if a Blue Lodge were to recognize the legitimacy of Prince Hall, uh, we go back to the late 1800s when the Grand Lodge of Washington attempted to recognize uh, Prince Hall as, as legitimate uh, Masons, immediately upon that recognition or that statement of recognition, numerous Grand Lodges from other states pulled their recognition of the Grand Lodge of Washington. If we jump up about 50 years into the 1940s, the same thing happened to the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, which attempted to do the same thing. They recognized the legitimacy of Prince Hall and immediately numerous states pulled their recognition of of, uh, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. So this one jurisdiction rule has been something that, that our, our state Grand Lodges have used quite effectively in, in uh, barring the, the recognition of the Prince Hall Grand Lodges across the country. So 
I'm going to kick the hornet's nest here and ask the question, is the craft particularly racist in these cases? Is this a reflection of society? Is this a group of bad actors? What's going on that a group that should be accepting, as we understand it today, is going through all of these issues about recognition of Prince Hall? My conclusion was that the fraternity was a mirror of society. And in some cases, we are we move forward faster than society does. And in some cases, we have we kind of play catch up. While not to overly criticize the, the fraternity or anything like that, there have been time periods when uh, we, ju we just were not with the game. We were not, we were not up to date. But there were also time periods when we have moved forward faster than society was ready to move. You, you know, you'll see that in an, on a number of occasions where the, the fraternity is more willing to accept, to accept brothers than what you might find willingness or acceptance within, you know, in society or in communities. And out of curiosity, I mean, I know we're focused on recognition of Prince Hall. What about acceptance of African-American brothers? Is that changing through this time period? Are we seeing more acceptance at the lodge level than at the Grand Lodge level in terms of bringing people in? Did you find any evidence one way or the other? Um, I didn't, I did not mark this as, as much of a, uh, a part of my study, but we do see uh, still a, a fairly marked division between African American membership going to Prince Hall and as opposed to Blue Lodge. We even to even to now, you still you still see that you know we have a lot of African American brothers that are members of Blue Lodge, but you'll see obviously much more within Prince Hall. Again, not you know we're not talking about something that is you know racist or any of that sort at this at our point today. But for the most part, African Americans who were joining the Brotherhood were joining Prince Hall throughout the, the era of, the, of uh, the civil rights era. Uh, you do see a number of civil rights leaders who were members of the Brotherhood, but they were members of Prince Hall at that time. Brother Thurgood Marshall, as an example, who was the first African-American on the U.S. Supreme Court and argued the Brown versus Board of Education case. You have uh, brother John Lewis, who just recently passed away back in 2020. And there is even evidence that Martin Luther King Jr. was uh, slated to become a member of Prince Hall in the uh, month or two following uh, what ended up being his, his death in 1968. There's evidence from the uh, past grandmaster down in, from his jurisdiction where he was going to uh, perform the the initiation for Dr. King. So for our listeners, I'm not, I, I am trying to put Jonathan on the spot to be brutally honest, but sometimes this is how history works, trying to nuance things out, trying to play with things so we can better understand what's going on. And, you know, when we're looking at the craft and reflections of society, again, I just go back to the idea that we are made up of, we are a fraternity of imperfect men. And society changes, ideas change. So always keep that in mind. But back to Jonathan, what about Wisconsin? I, I want to get into this idea of normalization and recognition. And Wisconsin plays a pretty big role. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we go into, if, if we're going to you know, uh, jump into our, our, uh, our TARDIS and jump, in and, uh, jump ahead in our, in our uh, kind of our timeline here, and get into get into the uh, late twentieth century, which, by the way, can you tell that I'm a fan of Doctor Who? I will. No idea. Uh, <laughs> no idea at all. But anyway, we jump up into the 1970s here uh, with Wisconsin. By the by, the end of the 1960s, our lodge records indicate that there had been a number of different discussions relating to the fact that we had a a Grand Lodge of Prince Hall Masonry operating here in Wisconsin. 
and what kind of recognition, if any, we were going to have or what kind of relationship, if any, we were going to have with that Grand Lodge. So we, in some cases, we took baby steps and in some cases we took giant leaps. So we did have in 1972, our Masonic code here in Wisconsin was adjusted to state that essentially a petitioner's race, creed, color, et cetera, were not allowed to be used as a, as a condition of membership. So to quote what it says, in accordance with the basic principles in ancient landmarks masonry, every petition for membership in a constituent lodge of this grand lodge shall be received and acted upon without regard to race, color, or creed of the petitioner. So that was put into our code back in 1972. And also in this time period, we did have an investigation committee that was put together by the Grand Lodge that included a number of different fairly high-ranking and prestigious members of the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin, former Wisconsin Supreme Court justices, et cetera, that were uh, tasked with or given the job of going out and investigating Prince Hall Masonry to essentially determine its legitimacy. Uh, so going back and asking the questions about whether or about how did the Prince Hall Grand Lodge get formed, how were they, how were they initiated, et cetera, et cetera, were all brought under scrutiny with this with this committee. And it brought back um, in the early 70s the the statement that or the the conclusion that there was no reason for our Grand Lodge to not to not give recognition because they would be considered regular Masons. That was not acted upon right away. However, it, that that's conclusion was brought back to the Grand Lodge. By 1977, the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin did pass a, a motion at our, at our annual communication that formally recognized legitimate exist, existence of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Wisconsin Incorporated to use its, uh, its complete uh, incomplete name here. Just to uh, pause you there, where does that put us in terms of other states? So where does that put us in charge of in terms of other states? It puts us at the top. Wisconsin was the leader in recognition of Prince Hall. According to what I have found in, in here and uh, the last time that we had a Grand Lodge attempt to grant full, uh, recognition, formally re formal recognition was back in the 1940s with Massachusetts. And the backlash was fairly furious at that time. And we in Wisconsin, there was no major backlash. We were not given, or we, we did not have our recognition pulled from other states. However, in discussing this paper at the last meeting of our research lodge here in the state, Silas Shepherd Lodge, I did find out a few stories. Um, Brother Frank McKenna, who is uh, our secretary, talked about how past grand masters of our lodge, especially in the late 70s and 80s, early 80s, would attend Masonic conferences outside of our state. And when they walked in the room, uh, grand masters and others from jurisdictions who disapproved of our actions uh, would get up and walk out. So even though their grand lodges weren't taking the action of going after us and pulling our recognition, they definitely were not approving of what we were doing. Where do we, how do we get from there? Where do, where do things sit today with Prince Hall in Wisconsin and how do we get there? So we, we jump ahead another, another number of years um, up to 1990 when we, uh, when Wisconsin passes a, another de uh, decree at our, at our annual communication uh, where we formalize visitation rights with, uh, with Prince Hall. So we're able to, uh, formally visit their lodges and where their members would be fully recognized as brothers of the fraternity. So we were able to converse upon, as we would say, converse upon masonry with the brothers of Prince Hall and vice versa. And then we'll jump ahead even further all the way up until to just three years ago in 2019, 
uh, when I had the pleasure as well as uh, Brother Chris here on the other end of the line had the pleasure of sitting in in our annual communication when we passed a resolution which actually allows members of the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin to become plural members of Prince Hall Grand Lodge, um, not of their lodges. Um, just to kind of tease that out a little bit, the Grand Lodge of Wisconsin has said that our members are allowed to obtain a plural membership in a lodge under the jurisdiction of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Wisconsin. However, at this point, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Wisconsin has not reciprocated this. So their members cannot obtain a plural membership in one of our lodges yet. So therefore we, we see kind of a handout on one direction and we're still waiting for the hand to come back from the other side. There is some, some politics involved here and also we have to recognize the fact that it, since 2019, Print, our Prince Hall Grand Lodge here did not actually meet an annual communication or much an annual communication for the last uh, year or for about two of those years, given the, uh, the pandemic. So there's a bit of a, uh, of a delay here, but essentially, should the Prince Hall Grand Lodge pass a, the same resolution in there, we would have essentially both organizations where where a brother from their organization could be a plural member of our one of our lodges and vice versa and where does prince hall recognition sit with the rest of the country it's a checkerboard in reality we have some states that are moving towards um, a status that that wisconsin has which again we are we're the leadoff batter in in all of these uh, scenarios or at least a majority of these scenarios, we, you know, we're coming up to the plate first and trying this out. But uh, we still do have a number of Grand Lodges that are uh, sitting on the bench. They're, they're back there for a while. Uh, in fact, as of the spring of 2022, just in the last couple of months, we still have four Grand Lodges across the country that do not recognize the legitimacy of Prince Hall, of their Grand Lodges. They would, uh, those are South Carolina, West Virginia, Mississippi, and Arkansas. Not that we want to call it out, but we will. Those four Grand Lodges still have not passed resolutions of recognition. And just this year, back in March, the Grand Lodge of Louisiana finally passed its, its recognition. Some of this is spurred on in the last two and a half years or two years with some fairly noteworthy actions or fairly noteworthy occurrences. For instance, in uh, summer of 2020, uh, Brother John Lewis, a member of Prince Hall in G the state of Georgia, member of the House of Representatives, and his credentials in the civil rights movement uh, go on for pages and pages, but are probably highlighted by being a, the leader of the uh, March Across the Pettus Bridge in in Selma, Alabama, where his group was attacked by the state troopers there, and uh, he was nearly beat to death, and also where he was the youngest speaker at Dr. King's March on Washington. When he passed away in 2020, there was a Masonic service that was held publicly for his, in recognition of his service. And there was some discussion that was had at the time because the Grand Lodge of Georgia did not uh, recognize the legitimacy of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Georgia. So if a member of the Grand Lodge of Georgia, if any of their constituent lodges were to attend Brother Lewis's funeral, could he attend as a Mason? Could he attend in Masonic? garb and act in or as a mason in that in that area so that dis, that discussion along with numerous others uh, brought us to the point where it's it was very very public i mean 
individuals listening to this podcast, if you've made it this far, which wow, you have made it this far, you can go on onto YouTube and find that Masonic service taking place on video. So essentially at this point in time, we have, we really do have kind of a checkered relationship. Wisconsin being, like I said, kind of the leadoff batter, but um, a number of, number of Grand Lodges kind of just starting to uh, find their way off the bench. And Jonathan, I want to give you a chance to kind of explore something. There's the nuance corner. I'll use this for interviews here and moving forward. I want to give you two minutes to tease out anything you think that we should know that either we didn't cover or needs to be emphasized. So the floor is yours. Uh, So this is going to be kind of my opinion here. So uh, take it for what it is. First of all, I want to kind of formally recognize the fact that I'm not an expert on the subject. Um, I appreciate the podcast uh, asking me to come on since I I did uh, do quite a bit of research on the subject, but um, I'm learning new things every day. And I'm sure that just like any other historian or teacher would say that, you know, there might be some things that were pre- that are presented here that there are errors in. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, you know actually what uh, what this guy is saying might be there might be a little bit more to it than that. That's how I run my classroom. And that I just want to make sure that our listeners know that um, I'm not sitting here with uh, fancy letters like PhD after my name. I do want to emphasize and probably the biggest thing that we, that brother Chris and I have emphasized in this is that we need to remember that we are members of a, of a fraternity that are, or that is dedicated to brotherhood, relief, truth, and that we are imperfect. Masons like to talk about this idea of a rough ash. We are not perfect beings. We are constantly in a state of attempting to move towards perfection. And more than likely, we will not achieve that during the course of our time here. But We also need to recognize that there are times where we have to put aside, kind of, kind of check our own ideas. Uh, We're told many times in in our rituals that that we have to, you know, keep our our uh, our ideas within due bounds. You know, really kind of check ourselves so that we can come to a better understanding. Don't get so. so entrenched in one thing that you can't see, see the forest from the trees. Thank you. So I want to just jump in and mention a couple of things. First of all, we deal with some of these dark topics and it's not to make light of or to focus on a particularly dark time in masonry it is not to rip down masonry, but rather to show you where we were and how we've grown. I want you to take away from this how masonry has changed, sometimes well ahead of the times, to become a body of acceptance. Sometimes we get tied up in what happened in the past without seeing it through the context or the framework of the present. That being said, I do want to thank Worshipful Brother Jonathan Trader for joining us and discussing his paper. And then I want to thank you, the listener, for joining me, Brother Chris Lidke, and the entire Further Light team on your quest to find more light through masonry. Are you interested in learning more about Freemasonry in Wisconsin? Visit wisconsinmasons.org. That's wimasons.org. Learn more about Freemasonry and access more educational content and further light. Any questions, comments, or suggestions, please email us at education at wimasons.org. Once again, that email address is education at wisconsinmasons.org. Thank you for listening.